This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel most of the time. I'm, I'm on a safari, some kind of a safari uh, in between information and disinformation and misinformation, education, not education, politics, not politics, Zen, not Zen, here, there. But I always try and keep consistent, deathly consistent. In fact, I don't think anyone would really listen or pay attention if I did not maintain a certain consistency. For example, I'm a fan of Atlas Shrugged, unabashedly so. And for the life of me, and once again, I'm not picking a political battle here, but I have a hard time seeing how somebody can be a fan of Atlas Shrugged and run for political office. Okay, I'm not belaboring the point. This isn't about politics. I'm just talking about consistency. Consistency, consistency. Anyways, that opening song was The Breeders. Sometime in the early 1990s, uh, Singer was from the Pixies, and that was her solo band. Like I said, the name of the song is Safari, and I'm, I'm on a safari. And her name was, I know this isn't relevant to uh, everyone out there, but her name, her stage name was Mrs. Murphy. Actually, my assistant is soon to be a Mrs. Murphy. I'm not really sure the relation there either. But anyways, I want to start this segment by talking about um, criticism, feedback, because I think it's important. There's a lot to be learned from criticism and feedback, and I've come full circle on how I look at it or whether, frankly, I even look at it. Um, I, you know, I, I, like to, I like to hear from people that, that appreciate what I'm doing and get something out of it. Um, the negative stuff is only useful um, – to instruct and perhaps show people uh, the way. So anyways, I did a, a podcast in the last week about chat rooms, and I kind of took uh, a direct counter to things like Twitter and stock twits. Basically, these are just gussied up chat forums uh, or the way they're used, which is nothing new. I mean, chat forums are nothing new. And it's filled with people promoting this or that, and most of it the vast majority of it is based on fundamental uh, projections, picks, this, that, the opinion of the day. And it never ends. It's a nonstop, continuous flow, 24 and 7, and it just never ends. And I, so I got a little bit of feedback on that podcast. Um, the CEO of StockTwits called me a bitch. Um, I, I actually thought that was positive because it, Bryce Harper, the, the, the ball player for the Washington Nationals this summer, the young guy, he's only 19, and he's kind of gone into a little bit of a slump, but he kind of said something this summer, and it, it resonates. Hey, if they're not talking about you, if they're not slamming you, you're nobody. You know, so I, Howard, I love you. I mean, seriously, I, I love it. Come on. If you're going to punch me, you know, seriously, kick me, kick me in the ass. I mean, really, really, <clears throat> Anyways, somebody who is clearly a fan of my work and Howard's work at uh, StockTwits emailed me, and he told me that I got my criticism of StockTwits wrong and Twitter wrong. I mean, basically all I said was, it's just, it's just newfangled CNBC, fundamental data, opinions. I mean, all the things that as a trend-following trader, you don't need. And remember, I started at the beginning of this segment talking about consistency. I, mean, I think if you go through my four books, consistent thought, it is trend-following thought. I'm fighting on a narrow front. I'm fighting on the front of trend-following, price-based trend-following, using price as your decision cue to make decisions. I guess that's kind of a little bit redundant, but you're using price to make decisions. Well, this guy writes me and he says, uh, how does he say? He told me he took exception to my characterization of, of uh, Twitter and stock twits. And uh, he said, I, I might have been suckered into thinking 
uh, that the way CNBC portrayed us Twitter traders reflected the totality of the communication that goes on in our little global village. Uh, of course, being, being the breaking news fundamentalist pimps they are, CNBC has latched on to the part of our community that reflects their approach to covering the markets. I'm happy to inform you the community is far more vast than you've led it to believe and encompasses traders of all types, from fundamental to technical. I, I don't care. I, I mean, I'm glad. He, this, this guy's a fan of mine. He said nice things about me. But I don't care that Twitter does all these things. I don't care that Stock Twits does all these things. My point is really simple in my earlier podcast. It's irrelevant. What's your goal? Start there. What's your goal? Is your goal to make money? Okay, let's start at the very basics. Yes, okay, my my goal is to make money. If your goal is to make money, then let's talk about what is perhaps, arguably, the great trading strategy for that goal of making money, price-based trend following. That's what I'm talking about. So anything else is extraneous. You don't need the feedback from some other individual all day long. Look, I know, I know, have become friends with, associates with, have been mentored by some of the really, really successful trend-following traders of the last three or four decades. They don't call up each other during the day and say, hey, how are you doing at your fund on this particular trip? I mean, they don't, it's not necessary. It's either do or not do. But you don't need, you don't need the feedback. You don't need the extra whatever. That was my simple point. Well, I kind of had a back and forth with this guy a little bit, not, not a mean back and forth. And he wrote me again. He, he said, uh, well, glad to hear that your eyes are open. Cause he kind of told me that my eye, that the wool had been pulled over my eyes and somehow or another. And I kind of said to him, I was like, well, well, dude, you know, there's four books. Uh, there's all these podcasts. There's thousands of blog posts. You know, what, once again, consistency. I asked him, I said, where have I been inconsistent in my views? And so he said, well, it's glad to hear that my, that, that my eyes are open. And uh, uh, he says, the way that Twitter is used in respect to trading by us is as diverse as the types of all market participants, whether online or off. And it, it just goes on to say, and once again, I, I'm, I'm appreciative that he says he's a fan, but I'm not going to change my way because somebody's a fan. Just because you say you like me and you like what I do, doesn't mean I'm going to all of a sudden sit down and have beers with you and then go ahead and agree with your wrong views. That's not what my game is all about. I have no desire to do that. There is either right or there is wrong. And there is a right and a wrong in many things. I mean, you can go through life imagining shades of gray. Perhaps that's, (laughs) if I want to talk politics for a second, perhaps that's the problem with America right now. America imagines itself as one big shade of gray compromise, and you end up with a stew of dew. I mean, there is nothing going on with that. So I I like the idea of it's binary. It's either on, off, one or zero, yes or no, up or down. Make a decision. But once again, so... To counter all that, I actually have been working on a kind of a a new edition of my little book of trading. And uh, Cole Wilcox, who is in the book, um, has provided a little uh, writing. And And I thought this was a really interesting counter to somebody who is seemingly missing the idea of why, um, why I might be criticizing, uh, stock twits. Twitter, et cetera, for the kind of fundamental opinion-driven stuff. And so anyways, Cole has this piece of writing, and it goes like this. I want to read this. This is good. This is verbatim from Cole Wilcox at Longboard Asset Management. Quote, trend following is data-driven, not news-driven. It's based on actual market prices, which determine profitability, not interpretations and analysis. So when executed correctly, it's immune to the politicking and herd mentality of Wall Street, CNBC, and other opinion influencers. When the data says buy, you buy. When the data says sell, you sell. That doesn't mean you always get it right, hardly. Trend following can provide a framework in which you may be wrong much of the time, but when you're right, you're right in more profitable ways over the long term, end quote. See how clean that thinking is? That's what you want your thinking to be, clean. You don't want to have a bunch of other stuff on it. You know, when I, when I, when I see some of the feedback from folks sometimes, it reminds me of, 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 I'm not being chauvinistic when I say this, but it reminds me of old girlfriends that might have had too much drama in their life. 
And I'm sure there's plenty of women out there that can say, you know what, I dated guys and I've got husbands and they've got all kinds of drama. Okay, but I'm a guy, I like women. Bottom line is I've seen, <laughs> I've seen my share of drama. And I think that's what you're trying to eliminate. And if you go back and you re-listen to what I just read from Cole, there's no drama in it. It's not accusatory. It's nothing. It's simply saying what is and what is not. That's it. It's not, there's nothing else in there. Once again, consistency. And I was thinking, it's like, you know, George C. Scott has that great line. You know, it goes something like Rommel. You magnificent bastard, I read your book. And right, if you, now here's the trick. You have to read the right books. So if I think back to my original friend, my fan, who was saying he liked my stuff, but then gave me this criticism of why he thought that um, I was wrong about these these chat forums. Uh, by the way, hold on one. I I have to I have to slug once again. <laughs> I'm sitting here slugging green tea. And if you have not drank, I'm not getting paid by him. But if you've not drank Sencha shots by Ituin. E-T-O-E-N.com. E-T-O-E-N.com. Yes. Grab them. Delicious. Anyways. But I love that. I love that quote from, uh, from Patton. But you got to read the right books. And so I, 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 I hope, you know, I didn't read the, the full passage from, from my uh, critic slash fan but if you just think about the general lines that I was taking from his long emails and compare it to the paragraph that, that uh, Cole had comp- uh, composed, you can see the consistency. And that's what you want. You want consistency. No consistency? If you don't have consistency in your thought process, you can't even get to the point of saying, I'm going to have consistency in my process of trading. You know, the interesting, you know, just to kind of go off on a tangent here, when I think about what we're really talking about is the psychology of this, the psychology of human decision-making. And I think about all the folks that I've had a chance to learn from and my own experience is pulling this all together. And truly, it, it, you, you have to be very zen about it. It's all about the moment of now. It is extremely all about the moment of now. Um, anyways, I don't want to belabor the point. I want to... Uh, in this next segment, I want to introduce something that I find um, really interesting. It's a nice reminder, and I think it gives people a perspective of the hard work and mentality that goes into making something happen, and to always realize that if you really want to achieve, it's going to be on your shoulders, no one else's. And also, before I go into this little break here, um, I want to remind folks, support the cause. Support the cause. If you want me to keep doing podcasts, if you want me to keep finding interesting people to talk to, and you want me to keep doing it for free, buy a book. If you've already bought a book, buy another. Give it to somebody. I mean, go spend 15 bucks and force someone to read something. I mean, they can kind of start at the higher brow, high end with the trend following book, which is a little more academic, or you can go to the little book of trading, which is a little bit of an easier first read. I don't care. Make them watch my film. Um, make them get, if they got to get past, you know, I don't necessarily, even all these years later, the title broke the new American dream. Yes, I still believe it. I think it's a fair description of what goes on, but it's really a trend following film. And, uh, you know, that's actually a good way to get people introduced as well, too. So anyways, though, going out, um, I want to, I want to play something that I think is kind of fun because, uh, you know, I always, I, I think back to my original fan critic that I'm talking about at the beginning of this segment. And he, uh, he wants to learn, you know, he's, he wants to get ahead. He wants to do better. Um, and he, I, you know, I, seemingly he wants my help, you know, he, he wants, uh, he wants my help. And I feel, uh, figuratively like Jake, I feel figuratively like Jake when, in the classic scene from the Blues Brothers, well, let me let me just play it first. Well then, I guess you're really up shit creek. Oh! I beg your pardon. What did you say? I offered to help you. Mm-hmm. You refused to take our money. Mm-hmm. Then I said, I guess you're really up shit creek. Ow! 
Ow! Christ, Jake, take it easy, man. Ow! Oh, Jesus Christ! Ow! Jesus Christ! Ow! Oh, 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 shit! Hey, shit. Oh, oh, fuck you, you man! Bitch! Hey! hey. Fuck. Jesus Christ! Oh, you fuck penguin! You know, hey, you asked me for my help. You asked me for my help. I'm giving you my help. It's in these books. But if you don't take it, if you don't take it, as Jake said, you're up shit creek. But to go out on that segment, um, I do want to play a little passage because I think it's got a good lyric. And I think it's a good lyric for, uh, for maybe some of the, the descriptions that people throw around. And it kind of just talks about the, the insanity of, of labels. You know, I caught this uh, great passage the other day from Milton Friedman, and he was talking about making pencils. And his point was ultimately political. But his point, if you really kind of take a step back, was about achievement, making things happen. Let me play this. It's kind of a long segment. It's about four or five minutes long. And the point of his whole segment, well, you'll see the point. Let me play this real quick. Uh, uh, Leonard Reed and I held up a lead pencil, so-called, uh, one of these yellow pencils. And we said, N- nobody knows how to make a pencil. There's not a single person in the world who knows how to make a pencil. In order to make a pencil, you have to get wood in order for the uh, outside. In order to get wood, you have to have, uh, uh, you have, to have logging. You have to have somebody who can manufacture saws. Uh, no single person knows how to do all that. The, uh, uh, what's called lead inside isn't lead, it's graphite. It comes from some mines in Latin America. The, in order to know, be able to make a pencil, you'd have to be able to get the lead. The rubber at the tip isn't really... Uh, uh, it, it comes from... Uh, nowadays, it isn't even natural rubber, but at the time I was talking, it was natural rubber. It comes from Malaysia, although the rubber tree is not native to Malaysia, but was imported into Malaysia by some English uh, uh, biologists, or botanists, I mean. Uh, so in order to know how to make a pencil, you would have to be able to do all of these things. So there are probably thousands of people who have cooperated together to make that pencil. Somehow or other, the people in, uh, in South America who dug out the graphite cooperated with the people in Malaysia who tapped the rubber trees, cooperated with maybe the people in Oregon who, uh, who cut down the trees. These thousands of people don't know one another. They speak different languages. They come from different religions. They might hate one another if they saw them. What is it that enabled them to cooperate together? The answer is the existence of a market. The answer is the people in uh, uh, Latin America were led to dig out the graphite because somebody was willing to pay, pay them. They didn't have to know who was paying them. They didn't have to know what it was going to be used for. All they had to know was somebody was going to pay them. And indeed, going back to Hayek, One of the most important articles he ever wrote, it doesn't show up in the book, but one of the most important articles he ever wrote was about the way in which prices are a means of, uh, uh, are an information mechanism. The role of prices in transmitting information. Let's suppose there's a great increase in the demand for uh, uh, graphite. How do people find out about that? Because the people who want more graphite offer a higher price for it. The price of graphite tends to go up. The people in Latin America don't have to know anything about why the demand went up. Who is it who's willing to pay the higher price? The price itself transmits the information that graphite is scarcer than it was and more in demand. And if you go back to the pencil thing, What brought all these people together was an enormous complex structure of prices. Price of graphite, the price of lumber, the price of rubber, the the wages paid to the labor who did this, and so on. 
It's a marvelous example of how you can get a complex structure of cooperation and coordination which no individual planned. There was nobody who sat in a central office and sent an order out to uh, uh, Russia, uh, out to Malaysia, uh, produce one more thimble of rubber, or sent a signal. It was a market that coordinated all this without anybody having to know all of the people involved. I just love that. That's great, right? You wake up each day, it's you. It's you making something happen. And I know you're going to say, Koval, I've already heard you say this on a podcast. So what? I'm going to keep repeating it. It needs to be repeated. What Friedman just said is dead on, spot on. Somehow or another, a pencil came to be. It came to be from all these different countries and entrepreneurs that needed each other to produce this product. It was not directed under the hand of state centralized totalitarian authority. And it's crazy because I feel like, I mean, look, clearly uh, there's no direct connection to Friedman's story on the pencil and trend following, except the psychological side, except the side of the person that's sitting out there in their house right now and says, I want to get ahead. What do I do? You know, and there's a choice. Right now in America, there's a choice. You can listen to groups. I don't frankly think either side has got the answer, but there, there's two messages out there, frankly. And the one message is that the state can somehow or another help you or equalize things. And the other message, which I, I, frankly, the entrepreneurial message, nobody's really making. But that's the other side of the coin. And I, I love that piece about Friedman because in a very kind of academic, wonky way, he walks through this nice little story where, you know, most of us don't think about how a pencil comes together. And you're going to experience the same process in becoming a trend-following trader, if that's the direction you want to go, or just a successful investor, however you, however you call it. You're going to learn little things that nobody else is going to know about the process. But you've got to get into the game first. If you don't get into the game, you're never going to know. You're never going to get there. I mean, that's just the bottom line. You know, one things. One of the things I, I have to tell, just to switch gears to kind of wrap up a little bit on this uh, segment. I, I want to bring something back up from the first segment uh, that uh, I think is is kind of cool. You know, I don't know. I don't know why I've been flipping channels recently, and I've seen uh, Reservoir Dogs. Uh, Tarantino's first film has been running uh, on channels a lot recently. I'm not a huge TV guy, but I, I'll just occasionally flip. Flip here and there, whatever. And uh, I just love the one scene in there. It's like, you know, so uh, it's, it's, what is it? Is it Mr. Is it Mr. Blonde? I think it is. It's Mr. Blonde. Mr. Blonde and Mr. White talking with each other. And, you know, I think for anybody out there that wakes up and, and I don't get as many of them anymore. You know, I had a friend of mine that I met in Vancouver, and she asked me, she goes, where'd you get all those interesting critics that seem to hate you so much to put in your book, Train Commandments? And I'm like, oh, it's easy to find them. Just go out there and poke around. They're out there. Um, and, I, you know, I've been, watching, I've been watching the online world of, of feedback, whether positive or negative, for a long time. But, you know, the, the longer that I get into this, the, the, you know, you just, it just... It's just all some kind of a noise. It's just kind of a cacophony of, of just nothing. But once again, to my point, great scene from Reservoir Dogs. So when you think about, if you wake up and you're like, God, that guy Covell, he just pissed me off. I mean, I want to pull my hair out. He made me think about things that I don't want to think about. I'm so unhappy with myself, and I now have to watch 10 hours of Dr. Phil just to feel good about myself again. And maybe if I go cocktail in the Xanax and down it with a little Jack Black, I'll feel really good about myself. And then maybe I won't feel so angry towards Covell. I imagine these kinds of thoughts go on in some people, um, or at least the people that know, that, that, uh, that don't like the message. They don't like the self-starter message. They don't like the trend-following message. And if you think about it, it's kind of funny. If you don't like the self-starter message, which I promote, if you don't like the trend-following message, which I promote, 
What are your other choices? Uh, the centralized state work for the state choice. Okay, you can go entrepreneur or work for the state choice. Oh, that's an interesting choice. Um, or you can be like a trend following trader, which is kind of an interesting, fun choice with a lot of evidence that makes a lot of sense. Or you can go, by George, you can go buy and hold. And you can just sit around and wait for the next president to tell you that they've suspended the free market system to save the free market system, to bail out the vampire squid, to let you play another day, and to just let you feel like you're so thankful that they've saved you and let you hang in there. So anyways, the next time, you're feeling it, the urge to rip me a new one, to stick a red-hot poker straight into my belly. I just want you to think about Mr. Blonde. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy, or are you going to bite? What was that? I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. Would you repeat it? Are you going to bark all day, little doggy? Or are you going to bite? That's such a classic line, isn't it, right? You can just see Harvey Keitel pulling his hair out in that scene, you know, playing Mr. White. And Mr. Blonde is so cool, right? He's so cool. Anyways, listen, um, good interviews coming up. I try not to announce these, but uh, uh, it's uh, real good interviews coming up. Uh, Podcast traffic is insane. Uh, I appreciate all the support. Uh, a lot of people listening, and uh, I mean, traffic is is seriously growing by leaps and bounds. It's it's quite amazing to me. Um, I, it's got to all be word of mouth, um, which is great. It says that uh, it says that the show is going in the right direction. It, it says that the guests are, uh, even though some of these guests people have never probably heard of, but I find them all it, it, terribly interesting. I mean, everybody, and I think anyone that's listened to all the episodes knows this is true that every guest has brought something unique to the table. They've said something, some nugget, some kernel, where you're just like, wow, that was cool. I learned something. And, and trust me, I'm the same way. I sit here, and I'm, I, I, I get a chance to talk to all these folks, and you guys all get to listen too, but it's just great. You just constantly learn something. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.